Nicola, welcome to Dark Mode. We're stoked that you've joined us today and we are so looking forward to the conversation that we're about to jump into. It is so relevant for the Australian New Zealand market and more broadly globally, some of the challenges that you and the organization that you are CEO of and co-founder, Cybera, are combating. Uh, so just to give a quick run through of what Cybera is, it's a technology platform that prevents cybercrime and online fraud. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Nicola, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of background on yourself and how and why you created Cybera, that'd be a great start for the audience. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. So yeah, I'm, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Cybera. Cybera is around two and a half year old startup and our mission is to fight, we call it financial cybercrime, basically scams. Scams are people lose money. And it's a direct result of my previous work in law enforcement. So before, before launching Cybera, I uh, became one of the youngest prosecutors in my native country, Switzerland. And during that job, I realized that one of the biggest challenges in financial crime is scams, online fraud. I dealt with hundreds of victims who turned to us, to me as a prosecutor and to the police I worked with who lost sometimes their whole life savings, sometimes smaller amounts, but often really large amounts. And when I started, this was maybe eight years back, dealing with those victims, trying to, to see what we can do. It just made me realize how, how big or what kind of scale this is and how often people get scammed and that there is not just millions, but really billions involved that go directly from victims to the criminals and very often to organize crime. So without making my intro here now too long, I saw two, three angles here where we can really improve. And it's what made me ultimately decide two and a half years ago that when we build a platform technology, that we can potentially achieve much more for those victims and for the, you know, stakeholders affected than if I would have stayed a prosecutor and yeah. Fast forward today, we keep going, we raised the VC round and we've helped already thousands of victims across the globe. Nice one. Thanks, Nicola. I am um, really fascinated by this. I've just finished reading Andy Greenberg's book, Traces in the Dark. We know stories of leveraging emerging technologies like cryptocurrency get used quite often, yeah. dark web and the like. Those stories of Silk Road and Alpha Bay aren't uncommon either. Marketplaces on the dark web running pretty rampant as it relates to financial cybercrime. And I know that you've got some really interesting technologies to help combat that, but what are your views on where that's come from, what the current state of financial cybercrime is and where you set, see it headed? I, yeah, I mean, very, very good question. So when we started actually our platform where we didn't really build it to help victims lost crypto. So we really started eight years ago. I mean, crypto was still a thing. But in my local office, and this has been similar across the world, uh, most victims actually were tricked into making wire transfer. So it's a traditional financial system. And I know, and that's also, you know, due to the media, crypto is being mentioned a lot these days and together with scams, and it is happening a lot. But we look, for example, at FBI numbers in the US, a lot of it is still happening in the traditional financial world. So we expand our platform to help in both those areas uh, because scams are skyrocketing both with the financial traditional system and, and with crypto. But um, the solution for us is really, you know, the lack that we saw is a communication and information sharing between victim, between police and between the financial intermediary, be the bank or be the crypto exchange. And so that, that's really one, one angle where our platform comes in to help victims, but then share data as fast as possible with everyone involved, which really helps prevention and disruption. Nicola, you, you mentioned the FBI numbers. We, we've got some notes here just to, to give the, the audience a bit of a view on what they look like. So according to the FBI's IC3 division, the financial cybercrime cost business is nearly $7 billion in 2021. That's up a percentage of 164% from 2020. Interested in your thoughts on what material impacts you see to the organizations? You know, we've mentioned the personal ramifications. What about organizations through your work at Cyber? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I come from law enforcement. So one part is that law enforcement, especially local law enforcement is heavily impacted by that. Often the resources are already before the area of offline crime and scams were very limited. So in the organizational level for the police, it's been very, very difficult to deal with the number of crimes happening and staying on top of it. And so that's exactly one area, you know, where we come in and help. And the other one is the banks. And then also the same on the crypto space with crypto exchanges. But let's take the bank example. So even your medium-sized banks these days, you know, usually get between, I would say 10, sometimes 50 scam victims a month. And it's been very challenging for those banks uh, to have an answer and you know, basically uh, support those victims and help them with what to do. And so that's really another impact we see in the gap. And that's basically, you know, where we come in and add value, um, uh, since we build an online reporting where those scam victims are then referred to, uh, they report online and uh, we give them help. We help them with response, trying to get their funds back and we give them resources for prevention. And so these are really for us, you know, where we see that just the scale is something that is unprecedented for law enforcement, but also for the financial intermediaries involved. Give us, give us an insight into the technology behind it, Nicola. We've talked a lot about the the value add. How is that conducted for Cyber? How do organizations leverage the capability and what? Give us an insight into behind the scenes on how that's applicable and how it adds value at scale. Said like a true technologist, Ben, straight into the tech. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my CTO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, basically, look for us. I mean, I make it simple, right? Um, what we want to do is something that I saw working as a prosecutor, we want to scale it. And that's why we build technology. And so to give you a, a real life story, you know, we, uh, when I was working with the police as a prosecutor, we had these, for example, Roman scam victims. So that's a person, you know, who got scammed and this person was tricked into making a transaction, a wire transfer, $50,000 for example, from Australia to another country, right? And now what happens every day today is when this victim realizes, hey, I've been a victim of a scam, they maybe call their bank or they turn to their local police. And unfortunately, not a lot happens today. But we started, what you can do actually is help this victim respond and help that victim file a complaint to the beneficiary bank, share that information so the beneficiary bank can react and potentially freeze funds. And that's, by the way, also what Interpol recommends. And we started doing that on a case-by-case -case basis and actually had success and helped really recover some funds for victims. And that's the background for me. I just, when we did that successfully for two or three victims, I started thinking, hey, uh, why is that not possible for every victim in this world? Why can this not be ha happening you know, for everybody? Why is it just the lucky victim that I guess turns to our department now where we go that extra mile? And so that's where we said, you know, okay, we have to build technology to make that reaction response happening more. Now, I know that doesn't answer it on a deeper level here, the, 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 the technology you wanted to hear, but of course, when we go deeper now, right, fast forward to the day, we have hundreds of victims who do a report with us on the platform, um, a thousand in total, right? And so that gives us a lot of data coming in, information, that needs to be secure where we have technology that helps and that needs to be analyzed and then put into complaints. And we send that out all in an automated way. So there's a lot of technology pieces, you know, within that platform, but it all boils down to enabling this, this global response and sharing information much faster. Ben, I mean, Jacob, as the head of engineering is just in Melbourne, as we learned offline, I'm sure you and the CTO crew can get together for a demo. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, what are you seeing as some of the more high profile scams occurring at the moment? Have you got any examples you could share with us? Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. So maybe where we, the most we see happening right now and also being reported on our platform are actually crypto investment scams. So I mentioned we started without crypto in mind, right? But when we opened up our online reporting, starting with, you know, government and banks, 
we organically, so to speak, had victims reporting with us, asking us for help and said they lost crypto. So we actually really opened up over the last six months, our reporting and what the platform can do for those crypto victims and for the crypto payment industry. And so since we've done that, it's really quite crazy. So crypto investment scams, sometimes now also called big pig butchering, because they often have a Roman scam element. That's really actually crazy where we see a really big uptick at the moment. And technically speaking, you know, most scams, uh, they're not high tech crime, right? They're, they're very often rather simple, but it's more playing on the human. It's more, you know, what you call social engineering. And yeah, specifically with crypto scams, criminals create these fake investment sites. They look honestly very realistic sometimes. And they trick you as a victim to make an investment and they just show oh, that money is, came in, it goes up, down, whatever, you know, they can just play with it, but it's not a, re a real investment they do at all. And so it's very easy to trick victims into paying more money, show them investment goes up. And at some stage they just cut the contact. Um, and yeah, so, so, I mean, just on a highlight. This one is really one of the biggest challenges we see today. It's really a lot of cases, a lot of money being lost, going really directly into wrong hands into organized crime. Really, unfortunately. I mean, it would be remiss of me not to bring up and ask your perspective on, of course, the SBF fraudulent case at the moment. Did you guys do any analysis into FTX, Nicola? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, well I'm following it closely, right? It's very interesting. <laughs> Uh, but it's not the kind of scams we deal with. So it's for me almost more traditional fraud case. Uh, yeah. Back as a prosecutor, you know, I used to deal with those cases as well. Uh, but it's as far as we know, an individual person who put it more on the classic fraud stuff, right? But it's not your mass business. So where I see, where we see the biggest pain point is, you know, the kind of mass fraud business, the scammers who target anonymously, you know, uh, uh, thousands of victims. One thing though, I would like to say is for, for FTX and crypto in general, I think, and there's a lot of trust being destroyed and there's a lot of skepticism and, um, I mean, I believe there is a future for crypto, but, uh, yeah, somebody has to kind of restore trust and, and, you know, and we talk about, yeah, consumer protection, I think really is a, is a key element, right? And, and that's certainly where we want to play a part because there is, you know, thousands of these crypto scam victims basically on a daily basis. And if we can help the industry and those victims more and more, then I think that's a key, key element for mass adoption ultimately, and to really make crypto mainstream after all. Yeah. One of the big ones here recently was the Medibank breach, which included 9.7 million current and former customers, if we can call them customers of Medibank that had their personal details breached. And we're seeing a huge uptick in, in fraud cases and scam cases impacting those victims. Yeah. In terms of advice, I know that Cyber does a lot with the technology behind protecting fraud and, and these types of, of use cases. In terms of advice for people that have fallen victim to a fraudulent scam, what's the next steps and advice that you would give someone that has been victim of a fraud? Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of our core business, right? So speed matters always. So the faster you react, of course, the faster you realize, the better. In the traditional financial space, usually contact as fast as possible your sending bank, ask them for a recall of funds, contact the local police, or of course, come to Cybera and report with us online, um, because that's kind of basically what we accelerate and do for those victims, right? To enable this, this global response. But in general, yeah, it's really about reporting your scam to the police and especially to the financial intermediaries involved. Now, when we talk about crypto, right, there's a bit of another challenge because often uh, as a victim, you actually don't know where your uh, stolen crypto assets end up or where you could potentially, you know, actually, you know, react with a wire transfer, you know, I sent that money, you know, to X, Y, Z. So it's all about reacting fast and informing the bank. That's number one thing you can do. With crypto, we're still kind of fairly new to that, but of course we realize uh, we need to help those victims identify potential places where that crypto is cashed out. 
And so that, that's one element also we added, but of course there's others, you know, providers from this crypto investigation service. And so that can be one element that helps to identify where those funds ended up. But here again, you know, it's a little bit of a warning, frankly speaking, in many cases, it's not worth the investment to do this investigation. And I think where we, we want to add value is recommend to all those victims if it makes sense. And also if it doesn't make sense, because we've seen an industry growing, you know, that sometimes victimizes the victims again and kind of gives them false hope and says, you know, uh, Hey, yes, we help you with the investigation. We can get your money back. But the chance often is, is still very, very little. Yeah, that's kind of my two cents on that. Nicola, we're just bringing it back to some of those emerging technologies too. I think it's an interesting area, but crypto, Web3, NFTs, it all exploded in popularity over the last couple of years, but they've also been the focal point of scams and exploitations. Do, like, where do you think those tech innovations are going? Like, can they truly be steered away from being leveraged by bad actors? I would say not, right? <laughs> but I mean, we also all use the bank and the bank, traditional financial sector and criminals use it even more. So yeah, it's like every technology, of course, is and will probably always be abused. I really think it's about building this infrastructure and trust. And, you know, that's again, sometimes as much in the traditional financial world, the case where also for many victims. There is not enough help when you call your bank, you, you don't get any advice. When you go to your local police, you don't really get any help. And so for us, it's really to build up more the traditional financial space. And then the crypto space and this, you know, I see it moving much more into a regulated space, very similar to traditional banking system. And so these safeguards and these trust elements, I think we have to even double down more to attract and make this something that everybody can, can benefit from and without a real risk of kind of losing all your assets or being scammed on a daily basis. Nicola, I, I found something really interesting and I'm going back to the numbers. I know that we're going backwards here, but it's predicted US $10 trillion by 2025 as illegal financial gain from cybercrime. Give us your thoughts on that number. So for me, Gabe, actually, what's your thoughts when you hear $10 trillion by 2025? That's two years away. It just sounds like away. such an unfathomable number. Just like yeah. how yeah, is right? the cost of that to be? And I know the reports are different and the stats can be different and it depends on how you interpret the data and do the projections and everything. But I mean, $10.5 trillion. So it's almost like a Sydney like... property market. <laughs> 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 Don't know what it's like in LA, Nicola, but yeah, certainly the Sydney property <laughs> market. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard to match what does actually mean that number. And obviously that comes together from many other smaller buckets that are by themselves like billions, you know, yeah. <clears throat> but for me, what really helps sometimes is to hear, take it out of the abstract and share my story. I was at like, you know, I started my career at one local law enforcement agency and really pretty much every day we had a victim turning to us who lost sometimes 5,000, but more often than not 20,000 US dollar, 50,000. And I've had myself, I would say at least, you know, 10, 20 cases where that was even 200,000 or a million or more. So now if you add all of that money and that's just the online scams, right? That I'm talking about. And so that's one local law enforcement agency in one country. Right. So if you multiply that by every local police across the world, then, you know, that's maybe already one trillion out there. And for me, it's just shocking, you know, a number is a number, but when you see it in law enforcement, I saw, oh, that's like this person sent 200,000 to this bank account and it was cashed out by, by criminal organized crime often. So that's really shocking, right? That number, a big part of it, it's billions. That's actual direct money that, you know, is very simple and easily cashed out in, in very, very wrong hands. And so that money is, is, is often, and it's hard to have studies here, you know, but that's often used also for other, uh, crime to commit other crimes, like even human trafficking and so on, sometimes to fuel terrorism, but it's just a crazy, a lot amount of money that is in the wrong hands. And then, yeah, that's shocking. And that's why, you know, I hope more and more people like these podcasts are important 
awareness. There's not too much that we can do. There's really just more and more we need to do to prevent this kind of stuff. In my absolutely. Opinion. Yeah, absolutely right. And it made me think yeah, the point you made just before, Nicola, about how that stolen money can be used to fund other criminal activity like trafficking. It's really interesting to understand the entire criminal ecosystem as it pertains to that life cycle. I think that's a really interesting point. I wanted to also throw out another couple of stats. I'm always really interested in this. Ben, you brought up 10.5 trillion costs to the global economy by 2025. Then in Australia as a localized lens, and it'd be interesting to see this comparatively across other regions, 33 billion in self-reported losses in cybercrime al alone, and that was in 21. So I wonder what a it self is. Self-reported too. So that's not even an accurate true number. Exactly. Like yeah, totally. And then a few other data points I was looking up recently, you know, there's, you can monetize an online identity for a thousand dollars on the dark web. You can buy malware yeah. for 50 bucks. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy, right? and, uh, yeah. I mean, the U.S., right, the numbers you said, I think the FBI numbers, it, uh, they say themselves that's around not even 5% of everybody who, who uh, you know, reports. It's one part also with our platform working with police and banks. We actually encourage them together with our partners to report more. Because if it's not reported, everybody loses out. Uh, that the information is not shared. It cannot be, you know, cross-matched. So the more reports here, frankly, the, the better. And that's another big challenge that many actually don't report and they don't know where to report. And if they report, it's not shared. So it can be used for prevention and for disruption. And so, yeah, that's an area where we really try to innovate. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. That stigma attributed to this is something that Gabe and I have talked about and very passionate about over the, the last few months. We cannot achieve a collective defense unless people talk more about it and report it. Collective defense is our only weapon against the $10.5 trillion impact to the economy in the next two years. It's a fascinating stigma that's associated with reporting financial loss due to cybercrime. Yeah, it's even good to hear 100%. you speak about it personally, Nicola, you, not only your time in law enforcement, but losing money through scams and the like. I had a personal experience a couple of years ago being subject to the notorious puppy scam where you know, the COVID laugh. lockdowns. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> told it a few times. I'm used to Ben laughing. So, <laughs> I mean, Ben actually got a COVID puppy, but I was a subject That's to true. a COVID puppy scam, unfortunately. And I do use it as an example to bring up that it can happen to anyone. There can be faux pas. It's that digital trust. Yeah. And I think raising the, socializing those examples, particularly personal stories, no matter who we are, does help to build and lessen the stigma and build that collective defense. So it's a really critical point, I believe. Yes, 100%. And uh, often emotions are involved. And that's why it's particularly nasty. And, you know, it's really honestly what triggered my passion also to kind of stay in that topic and, and really try to do more against this kind of crime. My first few cases, many of them were Roman scams. And it's really not just the money, right? The money is like, it's a very bad element. It's often people that are targeted who maybe are already at a low point in their life or came out of a divorce or something like that. And, and many, uh, you know, good things come with the internet. I guess one bad thing is that as a criminal, you can just target all the right people who might be in a situation globally where they're vulnerable. And so, yeah, sometimes I'm sure you know that over, over months and, uh, you know, they, they build a relationship just ultimately to scam that person out of their money and sometimes their whole life savings. And so then, you know, when you look at these stories, of course, it's difficult for them to report, to share. So that's really one place where we have to become better, make, share those stories help. And, uh, you know, really nobody is alone there. There is sadly every day this kind of situation happens. Uh, but I'm curious just to know for the puppy, did you lose some money and did you or how did the scam play out? Did you get a yeah. puppy eventually? I didn't get a puppy eventually, but I know we did get a cat though. So we just compromised. <laughs> <laughs> something. We've got a big motley yeah. crew of animals, but I did lose a few thousand dollars. I think the total cost could have ended up being about 6,000 Aussie. Yeah. I was able to recover more than half of that, thankfully. So I lost a little bit of money. Um, and then of course, yeah, like you speak about the emotional, the emotionality that comes with that, which is yeah. not only the anticipation to add a new family member, but also a bit of the shame around, oh, how could I have been, or I not seen those signs, but yeah. then I just use that as an opportunity to speak in the immediate family 
And then also just use it as an example. I mean, it's a really unfortunate event. Thankfully, it wasn't hundreds and thousands of dollars, which people can be subject to these days and just even the criminal syndicates and yet alone hits to organizations and the like. But yeah, a couple of unfortunate events there, Nicola. It's the psychosocial impact that isn't reported that I think needs to be reported because, you know, we all understand being in the industry, once a scam occurs, it's the stigma that's attributed to it. And then as a result of the stigma that's attributed to it becomes this internal crisis where one challenges their own identity based on the belief that they've been scammed and not being able to see and, and all these things. So that's a really important aspect to what we're all trying to hear, hear or what we're all trying to achieve in the collective defense here. Yeah, hundred percent. And I have to say, I think a mind change is happening or has, but also, uh, uh, frankly speaking, not everywhere where you report as a victim, it's so, what should I say, safe to report because I mean, I've seen it myself. Some police are very well trained and they understand it, but there's also a lot of, there is not that much education, I guess, down to the, you know, local police level and often the victims go to their local kind of police. And it has happened that the police just, you know, not doesn't really laugh at them, but just to take it serious or basically, unfortunately, it's of the opinion that, oh, you were like dumb, you know, that's your fault. And I, I mean, I've witnessed that luckily not in many cases, but I think that's, you know, horrible because then we're protecting the, uh, the criminals behind and it and every victim here, at least every victim I dealt with, when you actually know the story and how it happened. Like it makes absolutely sense. And it honestly can happen to everyone. So I think that's just a very important piece as well to encourage more reporting is to make it just the uh, safe, <clears throat> the understandable, you know, when people report. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Nicola, I wanted to show you, here's, uh, here's a couple of slides for them, the upcoming talk, but how adorable the puppy, puppy scam, here's little rogue and mocker, the, the eventual family that eventuated. So a bit of silver lining there. <laughs> But I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to also show some local scams prepared these with a Facebook pay ID scam that's happening heaps at the moment on Facebook mm -hmm. Messenger, um, mm -hmm. asking for payment on the Facebook Marketplace. I think around the world, but seeing a big prevalence in the Hi Mum scams, whether that's on WhatsApp, text message, Hi Mum changed number, can you message me on this new number? And mm -hmm. so the story begins. And then recently, reportedly in Australia, we've got the Australian Tax Office Twitter scam where people are actually yeah. impersonating tax officials and responding to inquiries into the ATO. So it's crazy what's happening at the moment in cyber yeah, yeah. 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 There is uh, one thing you have to give it to, to the criminals. They are innovative and creative, unfortunately, and they uh, usually play uh, with what's happening in the world. I mean, uh, the pandemic COVID, you know, was exploited so much. Any event that happens also, you know, in the, in, in the crypto space, it's just there's so much opportunity to uh, fool at like, the scam team. Yeah, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's an opportunity mm -hmm. going down. Well, uh, yeah, really have to double down on the defenses. And yeah, social media is another big one, right? So I mentioned these online investment scams. I mean, we do analyze you know, that data that, that, that comes in and there is a lot of, a lot of it originates on social media. And what we even see, unfortunately, because cybercrime makes so much money, they also have money to pay for ads, you know, on Instagram and so on. And we haven't been dealing directly with those social media companies, but I think that's really one area where we need improvement. And because how can it be that as a criminal, you can pay for advertisement and this advertisement gets published and promoted and the advertisement is about a fake investment scam. So for me, that's still kind of an area where we start, you know, to, to get into because we're now getting where this all very, very interesting data, but it kind of blows my mind that that is possible, right? That kind of the legitimate media companies or, or industry taking money for criminals and promoting crime. So um, honestly, that's one area I think it, it's very interesting. And I think that there, there must, there's more we can do with I think well, the power of uh, AI coming as well is going to enhance the, the nefarious actor's ability to sound more and more legitimate. So that's, that's a scary thing that I think is in the future. Um, for, the, for the listeners and our, and our dark mode community, I've just come up with an idea that um, uh, just for, for you, Nicola, I'm known for just speaking as it comes to my head. Some ideas are good, some are terrible. 
but I'm going to create a website where you can submit your anonymous, I was scammed. I would really love to have like a collective of stories of people that have been scammed so that we can we can help promote and de-weaponize the, the stigma that's attributed to scamming. So I will put that in the show notes when this episode goes live. I'm interested to hear some of your stories. Your other idea recently was the darker place, Ben. So potentially there's a bit of play on words there. That's right. The darker place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blows my mind on the oh, social great. media front, though, Nicola, as you mentioned. I think as users, consumers, particularly the general public, expect a lot more out of not only businesses, but some of the platforms too. There's an erosion of trust there, but certainly it's mind-boggling to think that, as you mentioned in that life cycle, you can post a scam or publish something that is nefarious, and then there's a whole monetization front behind that because obviously... There's a cut of money that gets taken from the advertisements from some of the big tech platforms. So that's a huge area, big gray zone, not next frontier, I think, in stopping some of the financial cybercrime that happens. Yeah, no, 100% agree, right? And uh, I mean, it's understandable, you know, you, you trust stuff kind of on these little cheat platforms that's promoted, you know, it adds this trust level that it's then hard, you know, to be suspicious about. So there's, I think, yes, yeah, there's really room to to do more on that, on that front, sure. Lastly, there was a really interesting thing I learned out of the World Economic Forum annual meeting recently, yeah. Nicola, around Cybersecurity Center, but they, in conjunction with Interpol and the wider yeah. industry, launched Project Atlas, which is to help yeah. stop cybercrime. I think raising the profile of that global cooperation piece as well. We spoke about earlier, the global partnerships. I think that's a really positive step forward. Um, especially with the alliances around law enforcement to actually combat a global threat. So really interested to see a lot more of the resourcing and partnerships that come out of Project Atlas in particular. Yeah, well, we work with the World Economic Forum and we're actually contributing to this project as well um, um, because it's very much, the aim is very much about what we talked about, about getting more data that's today in silos, you know, including scammer data or cybercrime data and pull it in a secure way together globally so we can see correlation and basically build bigger cases and, and push them over together, you know, with law enforcement, then have a more disruptive effect. And so, um, so yeah, this is one thing I've done previously as a prosecutor, uh, but now with Cybera, we're just continuing and doubling down on that, uh, working with, with nonprofits, um, including, including the World Economic Forum, but maybe you've heard of the Global Cyber Alliance and other big nonprofits that really promote and does a lot of stuff, really amazing stuff in that space, or the Identity Theft Resource Center that we're going to work together now in the U.S. And so uh, that's part of the, you know, collective defense. Ben, you mentioned it's really for me, Br bring these, you know, forces for good together. I use technology, help communicate, help share data and fight that battle together as much as is possible. Nicola, as a prosecutor or former prosecutor, does, does your prosecution want to come out and deliver some of that prosecution on, on these actors that you find through cyber? And do you provide <laughs> or do you help in, in, enable law enforcement to be able to do that? Yeah, of course. Right. And, uh, and, um. I do miss my jobs sometimes and often, but now, um, yeah, so we do work with, with law enforcement, uh, in particular, my, my native country, Switzerland, we are, have official partnerships where we help them with this quality data that we get. We do make that accessible, of course. And so that can help law enforcement to get intelligence and see connections and that they would not see otherwise. And so, um, I have now a lot of different hats, you know, as a CEO of a startup, but I, I often, of course, I'm very close to what's happening with our platform and, and it's exciting, uh, you, know, you know, just to see, to see the value of bringing such data together that can really ha help, you know, for, for disruption and prosecution. Uh, I hope we can, you know, have many more successes in the, in the future. Uh, together with law enforcement, because ultimately it is the prosecutor, the police that needs to take action in this last step. And our mission now is to really do as much also on the preventive side, like, you know, stop this transaction from going out in the first place, get money back. So that's it, at least a partial success um, uh, yeah, on this way to disrupt financial cybercrime. Amazing. 
Nicola, this has been really interesting. Thanks for your time. If people want to reach out, where can they find you? In uh, cyberspace. We remote, so they can, they can <laughs> find me in cyberspace. <laughs> a team member of our team across, you know, we're, we're Dubai, London, Melbourne, even our head of, of, you know, development for Australia, uh, me personally, LA for a coffee anytime. Or, you know, check out our website, www.cybera.io. And we'll be happy to chat with anyone who is, you know, interested to learn more about what, what we've built and how the work we do. And yeah, thank you very much. It's been very pleasant. And, and yeah, congrats on that podcast. But yeah, raising awareness for a very important topic. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us on Dark Mode. Really appreciate your time.